Yet you look around in New South Wales. Unions are refusing to accept even a temporary freeze on pay rises just for the next year. Not a cut in pay, just no more pay rises, just for the next year to save the New South Wales $3 billion that could be used to create jobs for less lucky Australians. $3 billion is a lot of money, but then New South Wales got an awful lot of public servants, nearly 400,000 of them. And you know what? Labor and the Greens say, yeah, too right, these public servants should get a pay rise when millions of other people have just had pay cuts. Weren't we meant to be in this all together? What happened to that idea? No wonder the New South Wales Premier seems surprised today that a wage freeze now looks like it will be blocked in Parliament. It's important for us to stake our position, to say why we're doing it, to acknowledge that other states have done exactly the same thing and to explain why it's important for us to be able to pursue this. It is just for 12 months. And, uh, and if, you, if you look at the whole picture, if you look at the context, if you look at where we've come, in, come from and where we're going, um, we know it's a difficult ask. We know it's difficult for a lot of people to accept. But we also know it's the best decision at this point in time. Anyone in private business must look at that and just think, what planet are these people on? And by the way, some states aren't doing the, exactly the same wage freeze for public servants at all. The federal government is, yes, and Queensland is, but Victoria, the hard left government there, you've got to be kidding, not at all. And get this, Dominic Perrottet, the New South Wales Treasurer, went on the ABC today to try to explain what I thought was the bleeding obvious. New South Wales is deep in debt. It needs money to put people back to work. Lots of people in the private sector have lost jobs and money, so let's not pay public servants even more. Not right now. But to the taxpayer-funded ABC presenter, Hamish MacDonald, this was mean. This was picking on people. Clearly this is being interpreted as a slap in the face for the frontline workers like nurses and fireys uh, who we all know have gone above and beyond uh, during both the bushfires and the pandemic. Why do they deserve this? What did they do to deserve this? Well, Hamish, I ask you, mate, what did 500 of my colleagues here at News do to deserve losing their jobs today? They're not simply being told they won't get a pay rise over the next year. They won't get any pay at all. Their papers are being closed because there's no advertising. What did they do to deserve that? What did the 600,000 Australians who lost their jobs just in April alone, what did they do to deserve that? And what did the millions of Australians in the private sector who've lost their pay, some of it, or they lost their hours, they're down to a couple of days of work a, a week. What did they do to deserve that? This, this is not about deserving. This is about trying to deal with the hand that's been dealt to us. Now, for these Australians who've lost money and even their jobs, to hear this whinging about public servants not getting a pay rise, a rise paid for by people in the private sector, to hear that is an insult. We're all in this together. We now know that is rubbish. If you're in the private sector, you're getting belted. If you're a public servant, you're not. In fact, you've got your hand out for more money and Labor and the Greens are saying yes, yes, yes. And whose side are the unions on in this? Maybe Scott Morrison could ask them that at the first meeting of his new Kumbaya Council of Big Bosses and Big Unions. To discuss this, I was joined earlier by Sky News political editor Andrew Clennell. Andrew Clennell, thank you so much for joining me. Andrew, look, we have had today 500 of our colleagues here at News yeah. lose their jobs. I can't believe when hundreds of thousands of Australians have already lost theirs that Gladys Berejiklian, New South Wales Premier, cannot get Labor and the unions to agree to a pay freeze, just a pay, f pay increase, you know, freeze on their increase for the next 12 months. 
What's going on? Well, the upper house is going to disallow this regulation if they put it forward, a, a wage freeze for everyone. So the New South Wales Treasurer, Dominic Perrottet, Andrew, he went to the unions and said, look, I want to put in some exemptions for some frontline workers, not many, you know, nurses, I'm not sure if police, but just a few. And the union said, no, look, you know, prison guards are frontline. This is what's been told to me by government sources anyway. Prison guards are frontline, docs are frontline, Department of Community Services. And they wouldn't draw the line that he would draw. So he's gone back and said, look, I can't, I can't exempt everyone from this thing or we don't get the savings from it. And so he, he and Gladys Berejiklian pushed through their cabinet this proposal to do it for everyone. That's been tricky because they recently gave big pay rises to senior executive public servants. And there's probably some community opposition to cutting police and nurses' salaries right now, but certainly not to the rest of the bureaucracy. And it is Australia's biggest employer, that 320,000. Where we'll go from here is Dominic Perrottet will enter negotiations with those upper house crossbench members and from there, and perhaps go to the Industrial Relations Commission, and from there ensure that the outcome is much less than the 2.5% increase that was expected. Maybe it will quarantine certain workers, not others. Maybe it'll just be a lot less across the board, although I think that would be pretty unpopular to give ordinary public servants any sort of rise in this environment at all. And he'll also mount the argument that you have to do this so the government has more money to create jobs. The test will be whether it's to actually create jobs or just improve the government's budget position. But it's been put to me today, Andrew, that this is almost a starting position in the sense that the, the government fully ex expected the upper house to perhaps block it. They start negotiating from here. Gladys Berejiklian, uh, mind you, very keen to point out that Anastasia Palaszczuk in Queensland has implemented this exact same policy without any sort of fight or too much of opposition. She doesn't have an upper house, of course. That's the main point they've got going for them. That's a significant argument. I find it incredible. There are hundreds of thousands of Australians who'd be grateful to have their job back. There are millions that have had a pay cut. And here is... Here are people actually squabbling over a pay rise that is paid for by the taxes of the people who have got it in the neck in the private sector. I just find it unbelievable. Labor should be dragged over the coals for this. This is just disgraceful. But it makes me wonder, Andrew, what does it say about the Prime Minister's chances of getting the unions to act in a way that creates jobs, stop looking after just the lucky people that have still got them when it comes to his uh, Kumbaya cabinet now of uh, bosses, big bosses, big unions sitting together talking about the future of the country? Well, yeah, he's set himself a very big job, hasn't he? But I guess if he fails, he can just blame the unions. I don't know, but he has said by September... Uh, we want outcomes from these working groups on five different points, including award simplification, casuals, enterprise agreements, compliance and enforcement, and got unions and businesses together and said, it's my job to get them in the room. Well, he's got them in the room. He must have some optimism from his discussions at Kirribilli House last week with the head of the ACTU, Sally McManus, Andrew, because otherwise I can't see where the confidence is, as you say. Uh, but having said that, hopefully the union movement have realised what a dire position this is in terms of unemployment. They've got to do everything they can for workers. And if that means trading off on conditions, then it should do to, to get more Australians in work. It's a, it's a unique situation. Yeah, well, um, that's the whole thing in New South Wales. The unions won't even agree to a, a, a stop in a pay rise. <laughs> They're not trading off anything at all. I mean, it's just... I just can't believe the mentality here. But anyway, there's a kumbaya rhetoric over there and there's the really depressing reality over here. But I tell you what, Andrew Clonell, I would love to see Peter Vlandes, the head of the NRL, made put in charge of the economy because <laughs> I've, I'm stunned. This bloke has managed to get the NRL back on our screens tonight the competition running again, and that is two weeks ahead of the AFL, which is the country's biggest code. I don't know what they've been doing, what Peter Vland is doing right that they've been doing wrong. He should be in charge of so much more. Get us back to work. How's he managed to do this? 
Well, I hate to say it, but if you put Peter Volandis in a fight with Gil McLaughlin, I think I'd rather be on Volandis' side or my money would be on him. I mean, he's looking to have... He's a head of racing New South Wales as well as you know, and he's looking to have crowds back at the races and the rugby league, albeit socially distanced and maybe a quarter full, from July 1. So he's gone for the next step again. But, yeah, it's remarkable foresight here. And I don't think the state health officials or even Commonwealth health officials a couple of months ago would have thought you could do it. But he aimed for the stars and he got there and he has shown up the AFL. And it's usually the other way around in terms of administration, it's got yep. to be said, Andrew. Correct. So... He's just pushed every button, used every contact he, he has uh, to get to this outcome and worked really tirelessly. And he was fortunate too, I guess, that the shutdowns and the quarantining of overseas visitors did to the numbers what they did. But he had an ambitious target and sometimes it's worthwhile to have an ambitious target if you work hard enough towards it. And it is a big moment for the NRL. And again, I make the point, not often the NRL gets one over the AFL. This is pretty significant, as you point out. It is significant for morale and I think it's also significant in showing a desperation to get back to work that I think needs to overcome the whole country. And uh, I wish some unions would start learning from Peter Volandi's uh, example of what it takes. Andrew Clennell, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thanks, Andrew.